Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest, and I live here in Austin, Texas. I've uh, had the gift of recovery since December of 1972, and I'm very, very grateful uh, for that and for all the good people who helped me uh, on this long journey. I'm interested in the history of AA, in the spirituality of AA, the psychology of uh, the 12 steps, and trying to help people go maybe a little bit deeper uh, into, into what recovery is all about. I've had some good teachers along the way. They passed some good stuff on to me, and I'm trying to do my best now to pass it on to you. We are studying a book by George Valiant. It's called Spiritual Evolution. And this is the sixth episode of kind of, kind of taking a deep dive into, into this book, because uh, I think it's important. And Valiant, he was a research psychiatrist at Harvard, and he also served uh, as a non-alcoholic trustee uh, for Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I put a link to his book in the show notes, and I'd really encourage you to get a used copy of the book. Uh, they are available. But my usual word of warning is uh, you might want to skip the first three chapters or or go over them lightly. Don't don't get bogged down. George is a scientist, and so he's he's going to give you some brain geography. I'd like to say, you know, what's going what's going on, uh, you know, in the deepest recesses of our minds. Uh, it's it's fascinating, and if if you can handle it, great. But it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is when he gets to describing positive emotions, because he's defining spirituality as positive emotions that, that we are now beginning to experience. So if you, you know, you know uh, what, what is a spiritual awakening? What's a spiritual experience? It's, it's not just a hot flash like Wilson had in, um, in his detox room. It's much more than that. It's the transformation of ourselves of our psyches at the deepest part of who we are. We're, we're becoming new people, you know, that, and that's what, that's what uh, step 12 is all about. And, and, and the other 11 are supposed to lead us to that. So what we covered uh, faith, we looked at love, we've looked at hope, and now we're going to go into joy. That's, that's where we're heading. So <laughs> come on board and let's dive in. He begins by asking, how, how, how is it that we can define joy? And then he says, in kind of a lyrical way, consider for a moment a gaggle of geese, a flock of sheep, a pride of lions, and a congregation of Methodists. What is the difference between how we imagine these honorable gatherings and how we imagine, well, how we imagine an exaltation of larks? An exaltation of larks makes us look up, not down. An exaltation of larks, like the word hallelujah, all and joy, all convey something wonderful, something limbic, not lexical. Limbic, lexical, right brain, left brain. You know, uh, it, it transports us into an altered state of consciousness. And, and, and what he's going to define joy as is really a joining, either a rejoining or a joining. So he goes a little further. He says, consider the definition of the word hallelujah. Hallelujah is Hebrew for the Christian exclamation, praise the Lord. Hallelujah is Hebrew for the Muslim exclamation, Allah is great. For joy is ecumenical. Joy is looking up. Hallelujah in any language means joy. And joy in any language means reconnection with a power greater than ourselves. You know, I think most of us spent uh, our time in the desert. We spent our time living in the wilderness. We were disconnected and we were alone. I love Wilson's line, we knew loneliness as few people do. And that's the starting point. That's, 
that's kind of the step one deal. You, and, and step one is not an intellectual game. Either you feel it or, or you haven't experienced it yet. Hey, what he's kind of getting at here is maybe like a quick down and dirty on the first three steps, you know, uh, and, and step one is disconnected. It's stuck. It's um, I'm not a part of, I'm apart from uh, hooked up with alcohol, sex, drugs, food, whatever it might have been. And, and it promised me something. It delivered that for a while. But now it's not. And I don't know where the hell to turn. I'm lost. Step one, and feeling hopeless. Step two, the return of hope. Okay. There might be an answer to my problem. And three is the turning towards that. And with that, often comes some joy. All right. Why? Because I am now reconnected to my source. I can be at peace. He says, cross culturally, spiritual joy is widely valued. Joy is a common accompaniment of all white light, near death, and mystical experience. He quotes a shaman. A shaman wrote, I sought solitude, and there I became very melancholy. I would sometimes fall to weeping and feel unhappy without knowing why. Then, for no reason, all would suddenly be changed, and I felt a great inexplicable joy, a joy so powerful that I could not restrain it, but had to break into song, a mighty song, with only room for one word, joy, joy. And I had to use the full strength of my voice. And then in the midst of such a fit of mysterious and overwhelming delight, I became a shaman, not knowing myself how it came about, but I was a shaman. I could see and hear in a totally different way. Well, that's what we're searching for, you know. <laughs> we start off with the not drinking, and that's that's uh, a must, you know. But that it's, it can't be the end goal. The end goal is to experience life in all of its depths, and, and those, that's what my teachers kind of kind of implanted in me. I saw that they had something more than not drinking, and that was what I wanted. How did they get that without the booze? Didn't know how. First three steps, connection, connection to this source of power that ultimately will bring, will result in inner joy. And, and I went to the big book, checked it out. It says at the end of step three, sometimes a, a very great effect was felt at once. Uh, I did with, with my step three, there was a letting go, there was an alignment. And I've done step three with uh, any number of people. And I can feel that in them. There is a reconnecting going on. They're not sure with what, uh, nor am I. <laughs> but, but you can feel it, you know? You can feel a presence in the room. I wish this story were told in the big book. Uh, it's not. It is in Wilson's biography, where he talks about going down to the mission where uh, Ebby was living. Ebby had come to his house. We all know this story. Uh, and, and he got sober. And, and Wilson was intrigued by what had happened to his friend. He knew he was an alcoholic. He knew he was as bad or worse an alcoholic than he was. And so he decided to go down to the mission and, uh, and, and visit Ebby where he was staying. And uh, of course, he got drunk along the way. And he makes an altar call there. It's an Oxford group uh, revival kind of service. And uh, <laughs> he escapes from Ebby's clutches and, and goes up and he gives his life to God. Drunk. He felt something. And he says in his uh, autobiography, you know, I knelt there among the penitents. And maybe for the first time in my life, I felt penitent too some joy, some hope. These were the things that were starting to come into his life and he could feel them. Wilson had known great darkness. And when you're really in the dark, 
it doesn't take a hell of a lot of light to shine in and you see it. He had his white light experience, but this was really where the light started breaking through a crack in his ego system. That's the way I like to look at it. And that, that's how the light gets in, right? So back to, back, back to the joy. What, what is joy? And he keeps asking this in his chapter. What is it? What is it? What is it not? He says, maybe joy and triumph are connected. Maybe that's why joy, like triumph, seems dangerous. Well and good. But why do we fear triumph? Why do we fear joy? Why does the triumph of joy feel doubly perilous? We're almost all afraid that after one shining moment of joy, the axe is going to fall. We need to offer people more than just not drinking. I said that earlier. And I think that is what the big book offers us. So I don't think I'm on dangerous ground here. It talks about what? The fourth dimension of existence. You know, we had an experience of the fourth dimension of existence. Don't be too afraid of that. It's, uh, it's real. And Valiant believes it's real. And it has the power to change us. It isn't a straight shot getting there. We experience it, we get into it, and then we leave it. But knowing that it's there, it's what we want to get back to. And we have an opportunity to do that. It's the spiritual growth and change that, that has to happen to us. He talks here now about Icarus, and, and he relates it to joy. And he says, if, if you know the story, Icarus is a young kid. And he's with his father, Daedalus, and somehow they're stuck on some Greek island. And how are they going to get off? So he says in, in the Greek myth of Icarus, the young lad has equipped himself with a splendid pair of waxen wings. When he rises up, as larks do, flying triumphantly, flying joyfully toward the sun, this is when his cautious father, Daedalus, warns him that the sun will melt his wings. Be careful, kid. Don't get too close to the sun. Of course, the kid does it. Off he goes, and he falls into the water. Some, some of the myths, it falls to his death. He makes a comment here, Valiant does. He says, how puritanical. How sad. What a waste of joy. After all, the sun is 93 million miles away, and air actually grows cooler as we ascend. Flying high does not melt wax wings. It makes them stronger. It is our forbidden, triumphant joy at soaring, not any realistic danger of falling, that seems so perilous that humans perversely forbid joy to each other. If we feel too much joy, we fear that we may burst. We're very cautious about this joy. We deprive ourselves of a lot of it. Kind of brought to mind, the kid was experiencing something wonderful, something freeing, something joyous. Be careful of that. <laughs> you know, this is the old people, the old people tell you, watch out for that stuff, it'll kill you, you know. And there's, there's truth to that, it's dangerous, right? But you got to give them something. You got to offer them something transformational, something that is going to bring joy and purpose and meaning and love and all of these positive emotions into their life. Not just, holy, geez, I'm not drinking. Got to be more than that. When I was reading this, I thought of the letter, the correspondence between Wilson and Jung, because that kind of got this thing started. And, and Jung was a believer in the transforming value of a, a, a psychic change, a spiritual experience. And, and he wrote back to uh, Wilson about the patient that uh, Wilson knew, uh, Roland Hazard. And he said he had sent him in search of a spiritual experience. Why? Jung wrote back, because his craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. But how could one formulate such an insight, Jung writes, 
in a language that is not misunderstood in our days. The only right and legitimate way to such an experience is that it happens to you in reality. And it can only happen when you walk on a path which leads you to a higher understanding. Roland was thirsty for something. Most of us addicts are. All right. What is it we're searching for? That's a part of what he's talking about in this book. And one element of that is joy. And, and, and so he asks, why do I turn to Passover, to spring, to Easter hymns, to try to express the passion of joy? He says, why won't words and science do? Neuroscience dissect the brain with care. They can sort of locate centers for grief, for pleasure, for anger, and fear. But neuroscientists have not located joy, for joy is more complex than a mere pleasure center. Joy, like love, is the comfort of attachment and of real relationships. Joy involves much more of our central nervous system than just the septal area and nucleus accumbens, which serve the pleasures of cocaine or heroin addiction more than the hypothalamic centers motivating sex and hunger, or the amygdala nuclei that ignite anger and fear. So I need music and song, the product of our integrated brain, to fully articulate joy. So he's saying, can't put joy into words. Words will not get you there, but experiences understood, maybe not fully, but appreciated, all right? They let you know that you've been there, that I've had joy, all right? It goes on to say it's a lot easier to talk about happiness than it is about joy. Joy, he says, is all about connection with others, joining with others. Happiness is all about drive reduction for the self. It says happiness is largely cognitive, left brain. That's why social scientists and economists love happiness. Why? Because it can be defined and it can be measured. In contrast, joy is a primary emotion. Joy is perceived subjectively uh, by the individual in our viscera, meaning in our guts. Joy is spiritual, he says. Happiness is secular. It's more like excitement. He writes, there's all the difference in the world between the apostles returning to Jerusalem with great joy after they experienced a meal in the presence of their lost friend, Jesus, the road to Emmaus story. He says there's a huge difference between that kind of joy and a film of Fred Astaire tap dancing up Fifth Avenue and wishing Judy Garland a happy Easter, all right? For joy is not happiness, he says. Joy is connection. We feel happiness at make-believe movies, he writes. We feel real joy at reunion in real life. We feel excitement in the neon lights of Las Vegas. We feel joy at a sunrise. Why? Because the sunrise is real. Joy is how parents feel on the day their child is born. Joy lingers. Happiness and excitement quickly pass. Then he goes a little deeper. He says, what is the evolutionary purpose behind joy. Why do we have it? Again, he approaches this as a, as a scientist and as a believer in 12-step recovery. And, and, and he believes that there's an evolutionary process going on. It goes on um, physically uh, through the ev evolution we have evolved as a species. It goes on culturally, and we talked about that in one of the previous episodes. And it goes on individually, that we evolve too, as, as people, people in recovery. I mean, I am not where I was at 51 years ago. 
And, if, if, and I hope you're not there either. Merton said something wonderful. He said, you know, if my, if my understanding of God is the same as it was five years ago, something's wrong with me. We are evolving. We're evolving, growing, changing, letting go of um, stuff that doesn't work anymore and, and evolving into hopefully better and changed people. We have a capacity for that. What, what is this human capacity for joy? How did it come about? He says, it, it, it's probably not rocket science to suggest that loving, hardwired parental care has provided a decisive competitive edge for the survival of children of great apes and homo sapiens. Children who are loved live longer, all right? They they're taken care of. Right, And this gives us an edge in, in survival. Since children will wander off, a powerful reward system is needed to retrieve them from freeways and from tigers, especially if it takes 10 to 20 years for them to grow up. In short, he says, joy is the motivational system that reinforces return. Return to what? In the beginning, return to mother. In the beginning, return to the family. To return to community. To return to my friends. It brings about joy. I, I can't help but think about uh, what's going on when an alcoholic or an addict uh, starts coming into recovery. It's a return to community life. It, it's to, be, to begin being a part of instead of apart from. We make a big deal saying this is a we program. When I do the serenity prayer, I always do the we version. It, it, it sounds different. It feels different. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We, 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 it's, 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 it's central to recovery. You can't do it by yourself. It's all about joining. And it doesn't have to be AA. I'm, I'm just saying it's about joining. It's about coming a, becoming a part of the human race again, all right? Being connected to deep, deep things within ourselves. Uh, brought to mind... Um, my own experience with step five, because if there's one thing, one step where joining really happens at a very in-depth level, I, I think it's in that fifth step. And I did it with a guy uh, who must have read this chapter because he understood what was going on at, at very deep levels within, within me and also within our relationship in that coming together for the fifth step. He said two things that I will never forget. And then it took me a little while to learn to appreciate. He said at the beginning, when we, when we sat down for the fifth step, um, that he, he was there that day representing the whole human race. He said a lot of people were busy, they couldn't make it. They'd love to have been there, you know, don't, don't, don't be offended but they couldn't all make it. So he's sitting in for them. <laughs> That's how he lay, lay, laid out the, the relationship. Uh, and he said, uh, I was outside the circle and I needed to be brought in. And he was there to make my return possible. He wasn't there to forgive me. This was important. He said, you haven't offended me. You haven't hurt me. I am here to accept you. I am here to welcome you back into the community. I could feel it. I could feel that I was out. And during the process, I could feel myself coming in. It's not an intellectual exercise. I've done fifth steps with people who very neatly got there. Uh, third columns, fourth columns, uh, first columns, all neat. And it's not about that, guys. <laughs> it's about joining. It, it's, it's about dropping the separation, the, the veil, the wall, 
that uh, I'm going to talk about things that I swore I was taking with me to the grave. And, and when I don't take them to the grave, when I share them with another person, my God, the relief. I've joined with another person. I've had the privilege to, to, to be the, 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 the other person in that room many times, listening to people rejoin the community. At the, end of, at the end of my sharing, dumping might be better. At the end of it, he said the second thing I'll never forget. Welcome to the human race. He knew what he was talking about, and I knew what he was talking about. I had wandered off, and now I'd come home. Joy is connection. Joy is joining. Joy, Valiant says, is being a part of something bigger than self. Selfishness self-centeredness that we think is the root of our problem and we have to become part of something bigger fanny goes on to say joy has something also to do with play now, we are not a glum lot <laughs> he says there's so much that children have to learn if they had to practice over and over again without joy learning would seem like the dullest part of school instead joy helps to develop the talents we were born with. Some psychologists talk about creativity. You know, you've got to find those creative parts of your life where the juice, <laughs> the electricity, uh, the grace, call it whatever you want, starts coming into your life. That's when I get in two-way prayer. You know, I sit down uh, and I open myself up to the beyond and, and the beyond that is within speaks to me. And, and I write it down. And what do I feel? I feel energized. I feel joyous, happy, free. You know, why? Because I'm not in that prison of self locked in. Talks about rat pups, deprived of play through temporary isolation will rush to play as soon as they get a chance. Rough and tumble play, hardwired in all young mammals, can be a source of true joy because it brings empathetic, connected feelings uh, with it. Adults no longer roughhouse, but as we grow older, rough and tumble play is replaced by sport, by singing, and especially by dancing. All are often accompanied by both joy and happiness. Rhythmic exercise becomes dancing only by the addition of two crucial ingredients, joy in another person. It takes two to tango. Two more areas connected to joy. He says, a joy is not only different from happiness, but it's also different from pleasure. Freud was very big on pleasure. He says that that's what underlies everything. And, and Valiant goes deeper than that, as does Jung. He says, no, it's not. Meaning and purpose are more important than pleasure. Finding those in your life, finding the source of joy is more important than pleasure. He says, consider the facial dance of joy that goes on between a smiling infant and the infant's mother returning the smile. First, social smile, then peekaboo. You play that game with the kids, you know? Cover your face with a cloth. What does the kid feel? Separation. Where'd mother go? Or daddy go? Drop the veil. Drop the cloth. What's the response? Joy. The kid feels joy. It's wonderful. It's reunion. Satiation does not occur. It could go on for hours. I can't get enough of this stuff. Pleasure, like the three-course meal, usually reflects drive deduction. All right, A just-fed, clean-diapered, and well-slept infant can smile at her mother with contagious joy. And that smile can make the mother smile and feel joy in return. The human smiling response is hardwired connection reunion community joy back with the scientist hat he says joy is how selfish genes unselfishly share it's a win-win all the way around 
Then he looks at how joy is different from mastery. Mastery, he says, is a profoundly satisfying experience, but mastery occurs only from our own efforts. Mastery is taking our first steps or riding our first 10 feet on a bicycle, getting your computer to download, or in my case, for the Zoom thing to work right, you know, <laughs> doing that for the first time. Our pulse speeds up, we're excited, we're empowered. Mastery, like contentment, always grows out of cognitive experience. Mastery lets me know I can, which is not a bad thing, but mastery is all about me. Again, a we program. And joy is very different from self-satisfaction. Valiant talks about the connection of, of joy to pain. Joy is grief turned inside out. He's spot on. He writes, consider funerals. There's no happiness at a funeral. Death takes all happiness away. But at funerals, there are wakes. And at wakes, there is humor. There's remembrance. And there is joy. Why? The joy at wakes comes both from the reunion with living relatives one has not seen for years, and from remembering and celebrating the life of the departed, we join with them. And so with tears of remembrance running down our cheeks, we are reunited with our remembrance of past love. And hang on to these two sentences. And love remembered no longer lives in yesterday. Remembered love lives triumphantly today. At wakes, love is often resurrected like the first crocuses of spring that triumph over snow. All right. Hardwired for this stuff, guys. And we need to be experiencing it. Think, think of the joy that we feel when somebody comes and, and stands up to get a newcomer's uh, token. We remember where we were at that time. We remember how lost we were. We remember maybe just a, a tiny inkling of hope. We kind of pass that on somehow to the, to the new, new guy or gal. Who's, who's got the guts to stand up and, and, and take it. We're with them. We join with them. Or, or at a year's celebration, we remember what that one was like. We didn't die. thought we were gonna, <laughs> but somehow we survived it. And somehow in little bits and pieces, life started coming together again. We, start, we started joining. We, we started becoming more and more a part of different things. In the beginning for me, AA was everything, you know? Sponsors told me, no, no hey, come on. We got it. We got it. AA is the core. Your relationship with God is the core. But now you got to begin to build and grow and, and develop and join. Join other people and other groups. Don't be just so locked in to this thing. Limited conversion was the expression they used. You have a limited conversion. You, you've grown a little bit, you've changed a little bit, but you're stuck, you know? And, and to me, the 12 steps offer a way out of stuckness and, and a way into life that needs to be marked by great joy. He, he concedes at the end of the, his little chapter that there is no easy definition of joy that just like there's no easy definition of love or an easy definition of hope or certainly no easy definition of God, but each of those can be experienced. So he, accept, he suggests, go and experience it for yourself. Put this book down and listen to the last movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. That, that last part of the symphony is titled An Ode to Joy, a song to joy, all right? Uh, a poem to joy. And, and perhaps he says, then you will hear what cannot be put into words. So just, just in case you 
don't know Ode to Joy, I want you to listen for just, just a few seconds. Eh? I took that from a YouTube piece. Uh, I, I put it in the show notes. I, I don't usually give homework assignments on these podcasts, but I'm giving you one this time. All right. Because when, when I, when I put the book down, as George suggested, I went on to, in my case, I, I went to YouTube and I, and I, I found uh, uh, several things on the ode to joy. And I found one that really uh, transported me. All right. It's what they call a flash mob. This one was done in, in Spain. And it's where they're in a plaza and, and one musician appears and, 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 and he, he's got a cello and he's starting to play a little bit of the ode to joy. And then from out of the shadows, uh, out of some alleyways, come one or two more musicians. And then from down the street come four or five more and they all join in. And as they join in, watch the crowd begin to gather around them. Watch the eyes of the children as they experience joy through the music, through the setting. Watch the fathers holding their children. And it's like they're trying to pass on the joy that they knew onto these kids who are just experiencing it for the first time. Old folks remembering, remembering that spring does come after winter that there's been a lot of hard times in life, but if you hang in there, joy arrives in the morning, all right? Um, and then the whole uh, group breaks out into song. I don't think you can, I've watched that several times. I'm an addict, I, I don't do anything just once. I get tears in my eyes, why? Because there's a part of my brain that's remembering times of joy, times of joining. Times when I, I felt alone and uh, not a part of, and, and I'm not just talking, you know, back when I was drinking, I'm talking, this happens to us a lot. This is ongoing. You know, we're afraid of this joy, you know, so, like, so we, 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 we deprive ourselves from it. But sometimes when it's just hitting you over the head, you can't deprive yourself. You get caught up in it. So uh, watch their faces, watch, watch, them, watch, watch them experience joy. And I hope tears uh, well up inside of you. Those are tears of joy. All right, a few lines from the big book. If newcomers could see no joy or fun in our existence, they wouldn't want it. Some from the 12 and 12. Joy at our release from a lifetime of frustration knew no bounds. Practically every AA member declares that no satisfaction has been deeper and no joy greater than in a 12th step job well done. The joy of living is the theme of the 12th step. So I want you to go watch that video. It only takes five or six minutes. Feel it, experience it, and, uh, and above all, enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> And I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and if you did, come back. And if you didn't, all the more reason to come back. So thanks for listening. God bless. Take care. Mm -hmm.